Thank you. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, I think this is a very important topic, especially now. So um, let's say that one of you in this room has been infected by Ebola. What are the chances of you transmitting it to someone else in this room? Well, I think it really depends on a few things. Uh, one, are you symptomatic? Because the virus can only be transmitted if you're displaying symptoms. So that can be fever, headache, general malaise, abdominal pain, et cetera. Uh, second, have, has anyone else touched you? So while the virus cannot be transmitted just by casual contact, so if I just shake someone's hand, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to transmit it that way, it really requires you to come into contact with, uh, with blood and body fluids from an infected patient. And so that can be uh, mucus, saliva, vomit, urine, and others. You can also get it uh, if, you, if you touch an infected person's contaminated clothing, so clothing that has been contaminated with, with, blood, with, bottom, with blood and body fluids. So say you touch this, you, know, you accidentally bring your hand to your nose, to your mouth, maybe you have a small cut on your skin, and that's how the virus enters your system. Now, in West Africa, uh, the, the virus is also being transmitted post-mortem because in, in, in this region there are um, uh, extensive burial rituals that, that, that call for people um, you know, washing the dead body, touching the dead body. And so we're finding that, that family and close relatives are being infected in this way as well. So uh, how did the virus uh, begin? How did, how, how did the outbreak first begin? So researchers think that the first patient uh, was likely a two-year-old boy uh, that's, that was living in this, this, this border uh, village in Guinea. And we do, really don't know how the virus got into, in, into this little kid. Um, but what we do know is that, is, is that the natural reservoir for this virus are fruit bats. And fruit bats can transmit the disease to humans as well as animals. Uh, so one of, uh, one, one of the complicating factors is that uh, there's, there's a lot of encroachment in this, in this region. So forests are being cut down. There's a lot more uh, human um, interaction with, with animals. And so that just, just increases the chances that the, that the virus will, um, will jump species. Uh, so, you know, people also hunt and consume bushmeat as well. Now, you can't get uh, Ebola from, from eating cooked meat from an infected animal. So maybe the boy touched an infected dead fruit bat or somehow came into contact with some blood from, from, an, from, from an infected animal that was, the, uh, that was recently killed. But regardless, the boy becomes infected, uh, he gets sick, he transmits the virus to his family, and they're all living in these really close quarters. So um, he transmits it to his, to his sister, to his mother who's pregnant, and to his grandmother. Now, his, his mother ends up miscarrying, and, um, and, the, and the village midwife who attends to her uh, ends up getting infected. And so now you can see how this virus has started to spread around the village. And as people are, are trying to find treatments and try to, tr trying to understand what's, what's happening, they start spreading the virus into more urban and more populated regions. Now, this virus, the, the incubation period for this virus is between 2 and 21 days. So if you haven't developed symptoms in 21 days, you're probably fine. But, the, but, in, but, nor, but um, normally an, an, an infected uh, person will develop symptoms. It's between 4 and 9 days, um, between 8 eight to 10 days, depending on, on, on what you read. Uh, but, and then about 50% of them or so um, die within, within seven to 10 days of displaying symptoms. So this is a relatively short transmission period for a virus. But if you think about it, it's really long enough for you to forget who you've been in, been in contact with. And also, it's, uh, and, and it also allows you to travel relatively long distances, um, you know, uh, and, and relatively symptom-free. So now, in thinking about, like, why did this particular, why is this, this particular outbreak so bad? Because 
It it hasn't. Um, there 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 are other other countries in 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 Africa where 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 Ebola is endemic. So why has it been particularly bad here in 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 West Africa? Uh, and I think it's really been a confluence of factors that have come together to kind of make this into this disastrous and seemingly uncontrollable outbreak. Uh, one reason is that these are resource poor countries with an already uh, heavy health health burden. So they're, they're dealing with, with other, other diseases like malaria and cholera. And to confuse this even further, uh, in the early days, Ebola viral disease was confused for, for cholera and malaria. Uh, there's also porous borders between Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia. And these are really colonial borders. They're not, uh, and not, um, not, not tribal borders. So people are continuously, you know, uh, uh, there's, there's just a continuous movement of people between these areas. Add on top of that, it's a rapidly spreading virus with a really high mortality rate. It's about 50%, although some, some predict that it can be as high as 70%. Um, <clears throat> also, the epidemic has now spread to cities and much more populated areas, whereas earlier it was just contained in these, in these rural areas. So it's much, much harder to kind of follow this, this transmission chain to try to figure out you know, who has been in contact with whom and to follow up with every single person to you know, take, their, take their temperature to see if they have fever, et cetera. Uh, also, we're dealing with a completely inadequate healthcare infrastructure in these, in these countries. There's very few medical personnel. Um, I read a stat that it was, it, it was it, it's kind of astounding, actually. The, so Sub-Saharan Africa has about 24% of the, of, the, of, of the world's health burden, but it only has 3% of the, of, of, of the medical professionals to take care of it. So there's very, very few medical, medical personnel. Uh, there are scarce resources, such as personal protective equipment and beds, uh, which, we're, which we're finding out. Uh, also, hospitals have become these, these amplification grounds because people don't use proper infection control methods. They don't, they don't use protective barriers just because they, they, don't, they don't have it. Um, there, are no, there are no isolation units to put, to put Ebola-infected patients. Uh, and finally, I think uh, decades of conflict have, have left the people in the area both fearful and mistrustful of government as well as any sort of officials. And you know, healthcare workers are falling under, under, un, under, this, this, un, under these officials. So, but I think of all of these factors, I really do think fear and mistrust has really played a really big role in sort of fueling this, this outbreak. Uh, now back in March, so March 22nd, was when um, uh, we, we identified Ebola as being the causative agent of this disease. And so there was both a national as well as international response to this. Uh, Doctors Without Borders and CDC sent teams down to, down to Guinea. There was a mobile laboratory that was set up there were hotlines that were that were set up that you know um, to spread the word that 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 the disease was caused by Ebola, and you know healthcare workers started to go out into the field, figure out who was infected, and started to conduct uh, contact tracing. And so this was you know end of March, and so about a month later, it seemed like the number of cases had dropped. Uh, there were virtually no new infected patients coming into these treatment centers. There, and also contact tracing had slowed. So the response community was like, yes, we have nipped this in the bud. You know, it seems like we have, we have, uh, we have this under control. But in fact, what was happening was that people were running and hiding from these healthcare workers. Because, because these people, and this was in, in, in the early days, they would come into the villages dressed in their biohazard suits, which may as well have been space suits. You can't see their faces. You can't see an inch of skin. And that's for a reason, right? Because you don't want, you don't want to get an, an infected person's body fluids and stuff on you. And so they have, they're just completely covered. And so people, uh, and you know, these, these, these healthcare workers would identify their, their infected, uh, the, the infected person take them away to these isolation units, and half of them died. So 
the people started to equate healthcare workers and isolation units with death. And so because of that, uh, they just, they, they, they stayed at home and they kept spreading the virus uh, and, and, and not really seeking any treatment. So by the end of May, uh, Ebola viral, viral disease came back with a vengeance, and there were a lot more cases than, than, than we could handle. Um, and, it's, and, and, and it wasn't just from, from, from the villages close by. People were coming from like hundreds of miles away to seek treatment. And so today it has spread to five countries, with Sierra Leone and Liberia being uh, the worst hit of all. Um, about a little over 5,800 people have been infected, and about 50% of them are dead. Now, Ebola viral disease can be controlled, and it has been in the past, although in comparison to the number of people who are being infected now, that number looks really, really small. So this was back in 2000 in a, in a northern town of Uganda called Gulu. About 425 people were, were infected with Ebola. And the Ugandan government, uh, with the help of CDC, WHO, and others, have become really, really good at rapidly identifying cases, isolating patients, conducting contact tracing, conducting safe burials, and also enforcing social distancing measures like, school, like closing schools, closing markets. And also, um, they, they, do, they do public health campaigns and education campaigns to educate both, both the public as well as, as well as the healthcare workers. But with this outbreak, and you guys have maybe, maybe heard the numbers from, from CDC a couple days ago, uh, they predict uh, with their, their Ebola viral model that if conditions that, that, that were present back in August and things have changed slightly uh, continue, that they predict about 550,000 to 1.4 million people can be infected from Sierra Le Leone and Liberia. Now, if you look at the 1.4 million number, that's 10% of the, of the combined population of these two countries. That's a lot. <laughs> Granted, that's a model, and, you know, it's, it, it, uh, and, and we don't think that that many people will, will become infected, but something needs to change. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's already a humanitarian crisis right now with 6,000 people dead, or clo close to 6,000 uh, infected, I'm sorry. But we need to make sure that it doesn't get, get worse. Because, you know, we're already seeing second order effects from this outbreak. There are, um, you know, there's, there's, there's already economic repercussions. The mining industry, agriculture industry, service industries have, are, uh, have, have been affected. I heard yesterday that, um, that, that, that the oil tankers might have, are, are threatening to not, to not stop in, in, these, in these countries, which can affect fuel supply. And um, IMF has predicted that there will be about a 3.5% uh, reduction in growth which can be devastating for these already poor countries, right? So you're going to push more people into poverty. There's going to be food scarcity, political instability. There's going to be a whole host of other, other health problems that we need to be thinking about as well. And so I'll just finally end with, you know, what, what are we doing and, and, and what should we be doing? Uh, there's been um, a, a little late, but, uh, but WHO... Um, uh, declared a public health emergency of international concern, a fake, on, on, on August 8th. Uh, and, and, and the U.S., uh, President Obama has pledged uh, to send, I think, about 2,000 troops uh, to, to Liberia. They're going to send, uh, or are sending uh, materials to build uh, uh, field hospitals. They're sending healthcare workers. They're sending community care kits, as well as, as much needed medical supplies. Uh, in addition, we're also fast-tracking vaccine development as well as, as, as development of, of, of other drugs. And all of these things absolutely need to happen to, con to, to control the outbreak in the short term. But we also really need to think hard about how we're spending money so that we actually build a resilient as well as sustainable public health infrastructure that can, that can withstand the next outbreak. 
because the next one is coming. It really is a matter of time, not to be a Debbie Downer, but that really is coming. And you know, I, I really don't think this is a freak loan incident. 